toward the last days. I'm going to ask you just to turn my mic down just a little bit, please. What is a pastor's job? If I was to ask you to write a job description, what would you tell me is the pastor's job? Vacuuming the floors, dusting off things, doing the clerical work, making sure everybody's happy, which is impossible. We see many churches today, and we see many mega churches today, and I'm not against mega churches. I am against seeker friendly churches. I don't believe it's biblical. I don't believe they have a leg to stand on, and I believe that when the time comes, when persecution comes against it, most of them, now hear what I'm saying, most of them, not all of them, most of them will run for the hills because it's a me-centered gospel. When I began to prepare this a few weeks ago, as I was seeking the Lord, and I said, Lord, what do you want me to share on Sunday morning? Because you have to understand, we've been doing this for years. We've been here now over 10 years, and I believe I preached over 1,000 sermons already. And after a while, you, you don't want to repeat yourself. And I remember about a year or so ago, I preached on Jezebel, but not from this angle, not looking at it from this particular angle. Uh, avenue that we're going to travel today. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what is the main objective of a pastor? And he showed me in the book of Ezekiel, if you can just give me that scripture up on the top there. I even thought about cutting out having visual scriptures on the board, because you know why? It makes people lazy. They like to sit with their arms folded. They have no desire to look into the Word of God, to search the Word of God, to see if these things be so. And I honestly thought, I said, you know, maybe I won't be putting the scriptures up on the board anymore. Maybe I'll, it'll cause you to bring your Bibles But pastor, sometimes I forget my Bible. If we would only remember our Bible as much as we remember our cell phones. Hello. I have my cell phone. I'm going to make sure I get it on vibrate, not on ring, ring. Some of us, when we leave the house and we get down the road and we don't have our cell phones, we begin to panic. We begin to have convulsions. We begin to turn our automobile or have whoever's driving us turn around. I've got to go home and get my telephone. But how many of us would do that if we were in our car on our way to church and we forgot our Bibles? It's interesting. But in Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 23, and I didn't want you to feel guilty as I hear the pages of your Bibles being turned. But I only said that to give you an awareness that we've become very lazy in society, especially in the church, where everything is done for us. We're spoon-fed. We don't feast on God's Word at home. We only wait till we come to church. And I want to tell you that I would not be where I am today if I only feasted on Sunday mornings and Wednesday night Bible studies. I would not have accomplished the things I've accomplished just on those two particular avenues. Many that have known me for many years could tell you there were times where I would study six to eight hours a day every single day getting into the Word, reading the Word, trying to understand more and more, and still growing and still developing in the things of God. He 
even earning two degrees does not mean I've, I've come to the end of knowing everything. In fact, when you come to that conclusion, you're about to bust open with pride and arrogance. But when you finally come to the realization that the, the many degrees you do have only brings you to the acknowledgement of how much you do not know. Mm -hmm. You can have a master's degree. And in that master's, they kind of make you sense like you've mastered that thing, but you really haven't. When you begin to study some of the deeper things in the theology and different philosophies and ideologies and things, you begin to realize just how much we really don't know. And I believe that's the safest place for a person to be that is in trying to know the, the word of God and trying to learn and understand what God is saying. Did I give you the right scripture? That's not the one. That's not what I have here. Hold on a minute. Let me see. Am I in the right place? Maybe I got the wrong one. Hold on. I think I do. 44, I'm sorry. 44, 23. I said, that does not look right. Forty-four, Ezekiel forty-four, twenty-three. Just reverse that. We got everything backwards today. We had the trays backwards. Ezekiel forty-four, twenty-three. Yes. This was talking about the priests that were the priests in the Levitical priesthood. They were over the house of God. And this is what they said. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to what? Discern between the unclean and the clean. That is one of the major responsibilities of, of, of a pastor is to be able to hold the navigation of that church in a place where the people are taught and they are learned how to discern between what is right and what is wrong. Now you say, well, you don't need a pastor for that. Trust me. There are many people that are out there that even under pastors don't have an ounce of discernment. Discernment is one of the things that we need in these last days greater than many, many other things that we need. I would rather have discernment than a million dollars. And I mean that. If I didn't have discernment to know what is right and what is wrong, we'd be in trouble. I'd be in trouble. A couple of years ago, God woke me up in the middle of, a, of at night. I was sound asleep. And the Lord woke me and told me, he says, I want you to separate the profane from the holy. Right out of a dead sleep, my wife said, what's wrong? And when he said that, I knew exactly what he was saying because it took me to a portion of scripture of Nathan. Uh, was it Nathan? And Abihu? Which one was it? I forget. I don't know everything. But it's the one where they offered strange fire. Nadab and Abihu. Thank you. I knew I'd get it in a moment. Nadab and Abihu. When they offered strange fire before the Lord. And I want you to understand, and I want you to, know, and I want you to understand and know this, that I'm not a church basher. But there are many churches today that do not know the difference between that which is holy and unholy, that which is unclean and that which is clean. And I asked the Lord, I said, why is it? What is, the, what is the reason why? What is causing the dullness of perception in the church? What is it? Is it? We've made it so comfortable and so easy for so many that they don't have their own Ability to understand the word, to discern the word, to... And I says, it can't be that. 
in its totality because there are some. Praise God, there are some that do discern. There are some that will be able to see the difference. And if, Pastor, would you please put up that slide for my message today? The Lord showed me that there has been a spirit of Jezebel unleashed upon the earth. It's nothing new. It's not a new revelation. It's not a new revelation. It's nothing new. It's been around for centuries and centuries and centuries because the spirit of Jezebel doesn't die. It's alive. And if you look at that, that shooting beam, it's aiming right for the United States. And I can I tell you already, the beam has already landed. The spirits are already here. Let's look in Ezekiel for a moment, 22, verse 25. Not only do I want to talk about Jezebel that is unleashed in the church, but I also want to talk about Jezebel that's released in the earth. Now some people would put... a gender on it. And we have to take what the Bible says, amen? The literal Jezebel that lived back in Israel, that married Ahab, the king of Israel, who was the daughter of Ethbal, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, who was the king of Sidon, was a Baal worshiper. Understand we're talking about Israel, a kingdom of this earth, a nation. And Ahab was a political leader. And by marrying Jezebel, he was actually compromising. He was compromising so that the Zai... Donians would not attack him. He made an alliance with an unholy people. We see this in our nation. And I'll be very careful. But I want you to know that Obama is under that spirit. What is the character of that spirit? The one character of that spirit is a spirit of control. It wants its own way and doesn't care about anything or anyone else, but wants what it wants. We see that spirit alive in Obama. Bypasses Congress to pass the, the laws that he wants passed, to reinterpret the laws that he wants to reinterpret, which is not his job, it's the job of legislation. Legislation is what changes laws, not the, not the executive branch. So we see that spirit working through our very leader. It saddened me the other day when I heard on, I, w I believe it was CNN or Fox News, I, I forget which one it was, that ISIS is now targeting something new, which is not really new. 
They're going after the women that have children. And they're taking their children and beginning to train them in the ways of jihad. So that they can have future generations that will continue on with the fight. And my heart broke. And then I told Linda, I said, what is the motivating factor? And I started to think, the one thing that ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the whole lineage of Ishmael hates are the Jews. Israel. They hate Israel. They hate the Christian too. They persecuted the Jews, but they also persecute Christians. But the Jews have suffered longer, for the church has only been in existence about 2,000 some odd years. But before that, the Jews experienced much persecution. Just for being a nation, just for being Jewish. There was an anti-Semitic spirit also involved in Jezebel. If you remember Jezebel, she went and she, killed all, she was killing all the prophets of God. Silencing all the prophets of God. But there was one person that hid the, about a hundred prophets by fifties in a cave. But a lot of the prophets were slain. And we see that today in our government. That same spirit. What do prophets represent? Those that proclaim the word. Those that proclaim the word of God. That speak the word of God. What is, what is Obama doing through all of these hate crime bills? And silencing Christians. We can't speak about homosexuality. We can't speak about this. We can't speak about that. The very same spirit of Jezebel is working in our government. Silencing. Taking away our rights. Silencing our voices. Because that spirit is still alive. The same spirit. Oh, her body may have been thrown out of the window and, and tra trampled under Jehu's chariot. But I want you to understand that spirit that lived inside of her is a spirit of witchcraft. It's a spirit of whoredom. We see that spirit released in America. The looseness. The vileness. The party spirit. Notice that the Bible says about Jezebel that all the, fa the uh, 850 false prophets ate at her table. They associated, they kept in contact with this Jezebel that literally lived during the king Ahab's rule. But in Ezekiel 20, uh, 22 verse 25, he says there is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof like a roaring lion ravening the prey. We know from the New Testament that Satan is a lion roaming throughout all the earth seeking whom he may devour. That same spirit is alive today. Jezebel loves to dominate. Loves to dominate. And I'm afraid that in many marriages that are here 
in 2015, we have a lot of Ahabs alive. Ahabs are the men that will not take their rightful position. Someone uh, was saying to me, well, can a man have this Jezebel spirit? There may be some characteristics, but not in the same way. See, a Jezebel spirit usurps authority. Takes authority away from God-ordained authority. See, a man doesn't have that spirit because he already has authority. He has God-given authority. Not one amen on that one. But he does. He has God-given authority. Whether women like it or they don't like it, the man is the head of the home. God is the head of Christ, the Bible says. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. They don't like that. One of the most characteristics of Jezebel is the, is the democracy of feminism. And feminism has crept into many evangelical churches and many Pentecostal churches. It goes like this, the woman wears the pants. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Wives are to submit themselves unto their husbands as unto the Lord. And the husband should not make them do anything that the Lord would not make them do. You obey your husbands as they are leading and guiding you in the things of God. And if they turn from God and tell you that they don't want you to serve God no more. I would tell my wife Linda, as much as I love you, bye bye. She's not my eternal one. I love her to pieces, but I will not turn my back on God. I will not abdicate my authority that God has given me in my home. I love her. I respect her. But God has given us authority. God didn't give the women the ability to name every animal. Not because they're dumb. Some women are more smarter than men. It's one of divine order. It's God's order. Jezebel has an obsessive passion for dominating and controlling. Especially in the spiritual realm. They want to silence the voice that God has on the earth. But I'll preach as long as I can. Whether here or in prison. Because this pastor will not. Understand what I'm saying now. This pastor will not marry homosexuals or lesbians. Ever, under any circumstances. We love them. We pray for God to deliver them. Because he can. He says, They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst of Her priests have violated my law. And have profaned my holy things. I want you to understand that when, we, when you walk into a church or you walk into a place of worship. Hopefully it's not the pastor's idea. Hopefully it's not his thinking that he wants to have a church. I would say it this way. Anyone in their right mind would never want a pastor as long as they live. Pastoring is one of the most difficult, grinding, hurtful, getting your feelings stepped on. 
Not by everyone. Misunderstood, misunderstood positions that a person can hold. If people are in for the money, it's not there sometimes. If I was to take a poll of many of the graduates today in Bible schools and said, there's a church here in such and such a city, 500 membership, automobile expense, health care insurance, insurance for your family, a parsonage for you and your family, free of charge, electricity, gas, all your expenses paid, retirement fund, and we're going to pay you $150,000 a year. And then you had another offer over here, a little small church in New Bedford, maybe 25, 30 people can't even afford to pay you a salary. What's the percentage of people who would take that one over this one without any regards to seeking God? It's in the 80s and 90%. Because the church today equates success with how prosperous it is. Jesus said, a man is not measured by the possessions which he owns. Understand the Laodicean church had everything, all the money, everything they needed, they had need of nothing, the Bible says, but when the light of the glorious Christ came and shined upon it and revealed through a, a, what I call God's MRI and began to examine the Laodicean church, he said, you're a miserable, wretched, poor, blind, and you're naked. But that's what the Jezebel spirit wants to do. It wants to take an organism, a body of believers, and turn it into an organization where there's no longer a pastor who is lovingly tendering, keeping the sheep, but a CEO who is now a head of an entire organization. That's what Jezebel wants. Because the moment you step over, now I believe in organization, we need organization. But the moment we become CEOs and, and, and we become uh, organizations to that extent where we're, we're like a corporation and we run it like a corporation, we fire people like a corporation. I could tell you some sad stories of Christians that got fired from their job and the way they got fired was worse than the world fire somebody. When we become like that, the life of Christ is drained right out of that church. Because we are an organism. We are a live body of believers. Together, we grow together. Together, we, we support life as a body. And he says, his priests have violated my law, have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her princesses in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus says the Lord God when the Lord has not spoken a word. Turn with me to Revelation, chapter 2. Starting with verse 18. This is Jesus speaking to the church. Say that with me. This is Jesus speaking to the church. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write. Let me stop for a moment and say that the angel was not a literal angel, but it was used as a metaphorical expression to say that it was a pastor or a leader of the church. Remember, he's writing to the church. 
on earth a literal church of Thyatira. Sometimes we spiritualize everything. We need to take things for what they're written for. There was an actual church of Ephesus, Sardis, Philadelphia, Thyatira, Pergamos, Laodicea. These were all regions and places on the earth. And he says, to the church, to the angel of the church. So the angel, the word Greek there means messenger. To the messenger of the church in Thyatira, write these things, says the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And I wonder how many churches would exist under that kind of examination. Starting with the pastor, he says, to the angel, the messenger. Starting with the pastor, on down to the church, the people. His eyes are a flame of fire. What does fire do but burn? It consumes. It takes away that which is dross on the precious metal of gold. The process. I happened to work in a gold factory many years ago in Rhode Island. I was a security guard. And at that time, geez, they had bars of gold this big and that thick. And they used to melt it down. And they would take all the dross of that gold off to purify it. Get all the impurities off of that gold. And I believe when we're reading this here, we're seeing that Jesus has these eyes of flames. These eyes like flames of fire. That what he's looking for in a church is a church without spot or wrinkle. He's looking for a church that is repentive in their hearts. Not one of these cheap graces that are out there, this hyper grace that's out there today that says you can, you can continue to keep on sinning, you can keep on going to the nightclubs, you can keep on going out drinking, you can keep going out dancing, you can do all those things, and it doesn't affect your salvation. That is not right. His eyes are like flames of fire on the church. And his feet like fine brass. Brass is significant in symbolism of judgment. You say, well, I don't believe Jesus is going to judge the church. Yes, he is. He said judgment will begin in the house of God. He's going to shake those things that can be shaken so that those things that remain shall remain. Verse 19 says, I know thy works and charity and service and faith. There were some good things there. And thy patience and thy works. The last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things. What's the next word? I have a few things against thee. Oh, Jesus doesn't judge the church no more. Oh, we're all covered by the blood. All that's covered by the blood is that which is confessed. I have these few things against you. Because you allow, or you suffer, that woman Jezebel. Now here in this context, this is talking about a woman who came into the church of Ephesus. You have to do some background history of Ephesus, what was taking place in Ephesus. There was the worship of Diana, the, Greek, uh, the goddess there in, in uh, Ephesians. 
And so women were allowed to go into the temples. They were prostitutes. They would they'd do whatever they wanted immorally. It didn't make any difference because they were doing it to their God. They were allowed to teach things that were not proper. And here, God is speaking directly to John and tells him, write these things down. He says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against you, Thyatira church, because you allow that woman Jezebel. Who is Jezebel? Dominating, usurper of authority, the feminist movement, that has crept into the church of Jesus Christ. Not too many pastors will stand up and say this because they'll lose their money. They'll lose their tithes and their offerings. I have nothing to lose. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calls herself. She's not called of God. Self-proclaimed, self-instituted, self-positioned. She called herself a representative of God. One who speaks on behalf of God. Hello. And to teach... Very interesting in this word. This word teach, if you look it up in the Greek, you'll see it. Without going into all the legalities of it. This word teach, there's different words in the Greek for teach. This one ends in the, in the letters E-I-N. And when it ends in E-I-N, like there's a difference between believing and being a believer. There's a difference between teach and to be a teacher. This here is, according to the Greek, is talking about being a teacher. And she's a teacher, been established in the church. Why? Because of a lack of discernment among the pastor, the leader, the messenger. Because that's what Jezebel does. She comes in and flatters. She's one of the hottest workers. Hello? She gains popularity. You say, well, what about men? Yeah, men. You know what men do with their authority? They abuse it. They don't usurp it. They abuse it. Men abuse their wives. They abuse the authority that God gave over them. Because if you love your wife, you're going to treat her as Christ loves the church. Hello? You're going to nourish her, take care of her. This woman was in this church teaching as a teacher, got, got in good with the pastor. I remember one time a lady came and visited us. We're in the other church, next up the, up the corridor here. She came in and, Pastor, really enjoyed your service. Thank you for sharing. Left, came back another time a few months later. Heard my message. Came up to me, said, you're a, God wants me to tell you you're a false teacher. I said, really? That's very interesting. I said, and what would be the subject matter of my false teachings? He says, you believe in a pre-trib rapture of the church. I said, yes, I do. He said, that's not true. I says, according to who? She says, according to me. She says, I am a Greek study and Hebrew study. I studied the Greek and the Hebrew. I said, that's wonderful. I said, do you know your Bible? What do you mean? 
As you ever read the part that says, don't rebuke an elder unless in the mouth of two or three witnesses? Well, I believe this, and I believe we're going to go through the tribulation. You can go through the tribulation all you want. Have your head cut off. Good for you. That's what my Bible tells me that we're going. God's not appointed me to wrath. I says, and besides, you can have a different view of the rapture of, of eschatology. It doesn't mean that you can't reason together, you can't come and, and, and fellowship together. I have friends that are ministers that believe in post-tribulation. Close friends of mine. And they say, I don't know how you can believe in the pre-rapture of the church. I said, because I believe the scriptures. And I said, you give me your doctrinal position, and I know them because I've studied eschatology. I said, you give me your position why you believe that we're going to go through the tribulation. And every single time, they always use the allegorical method of interpretation to back their stories. They change Israel to the church. You know, they, put the, they take the freedom of taking that and putting it where the church is. And they say, you can't do that. I said, you have given me no evidence whatsoever. You've just given me a supposition. I said, so please, I'm willing to change my view if you give me something that's of value. But don't give me this stuff that you're giving me. See? She calls herself a prophetess, one who speaks on behalf of God, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication. Now, this is not only just fornication and, and sexual immorality in the natural, but, you know, you can commit fornication against God. You can be unfaithful to God. Hello? Hello? And this is the love of God. The next verse says, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Another characteristic of the Jezebel spirit is stubbornness. Now, if you go back in 1 Kings, I think it's chapter 16, you'll begin to read about Jezebel and where she came from. Her daughter was just as bad, Athaliah. Athaliah, her daughter, you know what she did? It's amazing. So that she could keep a hold of the throne of God, she killed all her grandchildren that were successors to the king, to, in line for the kingship of Israel. She killed them all. But there was one that saw that and took one of the, one of the little boys and hid him away. She didn't know it. But that spirit, all it brings is death. The spirit Jezebel brings death. Oh, it looks like life at first. Well, let's read about it, what it says. He gave her space to repent. She didn't. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into what? except they repent of their deeds. Someone read verse 23. Go ahead, Rebecca, read it for me. I thought Jesus didn't judge us according to our works. He does. I'm going to kill her children, her offspring, those who have been infected by her. What I meant to say before, and I got off track a little bit, when I was talking about ISIS and how they're targeting these children, I said to God, I said, God, why, why is this happening? He said, it's nothing new. There's nothing new. They used to allow their children to pass through the fire for the god Moloch. They sacrificed their children all the time. He said, then he said this to me. He says, now you know why I told them to kill the women and the children. 
Do you understand your Bible says that God, our God, Jehovah God, told the Israelites to kill the women and the children? People don't want to read that part of the Bible. But God told them to do that. Why? And I, asked, and I said, God, now I understand why. Because they were training up their children to hate and to kill the Jewish people. The Philistines, the Hittites, Perizzites, all the enemies of Israel, they would train up their children. It's the same spirit from Ishmael. What you're seeing in ISIS today is the same spirit Ishmael had. And God said, that's why I ordered them to kill the women and the children to stop that hatred. But the children of Israel didn't obey. They didn't kill them all. They let some of them live. You can see my time here. Behold, I'll cast her into bed with them that commit adultery with her in great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he that searcheth the reins in the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your deeds. I want to read something out of Jeremiah for a moment. You say, well, pastor, I don't believe that's happening in churches today. Let's read this for a moment. Jeremiah chapter 7, starting with verse 1. This is a very seducing spirit. Starting with verse 1. This spirit is ferocious, relentless, It is one of the hindering spirits to your spiritual growth. I'm telling you, when I was preparing this message, I felt nothing. I felt alone. I felt depressed. I felt like giving up. All of those spirits that come against a man of God. You say, how can that be? We have victory, we have power over the devil. Yeah, just like Elijah did. Went up to Mount Carmel, right? 850 false prophets, and here he's standing there alone, and all of a sudden, we see who the real God is. He goes out and he orders the killing of all those prophets. And when Jezebel hears of it, she said, well, let it be done unto me if before this day passes that I don't take your life. What happened to it? What happened to it? Elijah, he ran like a puppy with his tail between his legs. Why? Because there's a spirit of intimidation, a spirit of manipulation, and a spirit of domination. Those three spirits are active in witchcraft. And he ran for the hills. What happened when he got to where his destination was? He sat down and he said, Lord, take my life. This spirit wanted him dead. And understand that when you hear that spirit of suicide come against you, it's the spirit of Jezebel. You need to rebuke that spirit. He wanted to die. He was depressed, the Bible says. This man of God that just faced 850 pro false prophets, that saw fire come down, God kept Elijah for seven years. And all this woman did was utter these few little words, let it be so done to me if I don't see you dead by the end of the day. I've got to finish up. You getting anything out of this? I hope so. My hope is that you will begin to fine-tune your discernment 
in what is called the church today. And when I go overseas and I go to some of these other nations, they say, oh, I wish we had a church like in America. I said, please stop. Do not change a thing. Oh, I wish we had the music. Don't change a thing. They, when I was in Nigeria, they banged their drums, all offbeat. Drums are all crooked and broken, holes in them. But you see in their heart a passion, a desire to worship God. That is unparalleled to anything I have seen in America. They worship with everything, right, hon? Everything, even the little children, four, five, six years old, coming to the altar on their face, crying, weeping for their aunties and their uncles to be saved. All about drumming those drums out, out of whack. All the singers, one's an alto, one's a soprano, this one's here. They're all mixed together. Their voices are up and down all around. They, don't, they could make all this noise. And if we were to hear that in our churches today, we would walk out and say, I'm never going back there again because their worship's terrible. I told him, I said, don't you change a thing. And I went in there. As awful as it sounded to me, I'm a musician, I know music a little bit. As awful as it sounded to me, I just closed my eyes and began to worship the Lord. All out of tune, all offset, not even in the measure of the key, not, not even close to being on time. But worship the Lord with their whole heart. I believe God receives that over 150, 200 choir that are sleeping together, that are taking drugs, that are out nightclub and going all over the place and looking holy on Sunday morning. I believe God honors those things that when we worship him from a genuine heart, from a heart of passion, we don't have any passion anymore. This is how we sing. Oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sins away. Oh, happy day. If you only believed what you sing. You would understand the joy that floods your soul. Discerning. Understanding. What God has done for you. How he wants to preserve his church in purity and holiness and righteousness. But we have turned it into a den of thieves. Money, 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 money. Give me your money, 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 money for my ministry. It's wrong. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, just keep going so I don't have to tell you to keep going. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house. That means stand in the entrance. Stand where everybody's going to come in and everyone's going to go out so that you don't miss anybody. Stand at the gate, the entrance of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord. Oh, how we need to hear the word of the Lord. Linda and I, before we were pastoring, we would go to churches. And we hear people walking out the door of these churches. Oh, that was a great message. And the other person that was with them said, well, what did you get out of it? He said, well, I don't know, but it was good. Good preaching, was it? What effect did it have on their life? How did it change their thinking? How did it cause them to want more of God, to serve more of God, to love God more? To be willing to sacrifice your life for the cause of Christ. 
He said, say this. Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah. That's the house of praise. That's what Judah means. House of praise. Oh, we've got some of the best praise and worship teams that could ever be alive. But my question is, are they anointed? We mistake talent for anointing. Hello? I'll tell you, never forget this. I heard a little, 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 tiny, 80-some-odd-year-old woman at a church banquet, dedication banquet, that they had for their church. I'll never forget this as long as I live. I was there. I didn't even know Linda at the time, was not even married. And this girl sat at our table. I came and I sat at this table. I was late and I came and I sat at this table. And this girl said to me, hi, I'm so-and-so. I said, hello. She was single. and I guess she thought I was a good-looking young man. You know, I'm, I probably had some fire in me being single, but was not interested. She was very beautiful, too. She says, I'm going up to sing. I said, really? Wonderful. And after a couple of singers, she went up and she sang. And I'm talking with my friends that I had sat with, and she, she just sat down, looked straight at me, and says, well, what did you think? Wrong person to ask. <laughs> Because I'm honest. We went to a restaurant the other day and the food was lousy. And I told the waitress, the food's lousy. I said, nothing on you, but the food was lousy. Still gave her a tip. So she, she asked me the question, how was I? I said, well, I didn't want to crush her. You know, I want to be sensitive. I says, you have a very beautiful voice. Big smile. And then I said this three-letter word, but. And she looked at me. I says, you have no anointing. Now, you have to understand, I came out of the nightclub business. And believe me, some of the music we're hearing today is not anointed. And all, right after she got up there, this little 80-year-old woman, all bent over, crooked, walks up on there, you know, not afraid at all, you know, nervous but not afraid, gets up there, she's got her hymnal, and she's shaking like a leaf. And she starts to sing, count your blessings, count them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings. And she's shaking like a leaf. I'm telling you, the power of God was on that woman. The anointing was on that woman. People were weeping. People were crying. Say to the house of Judah, the house of praise, then enter into these gates to worship the Lord. Just keep going as I finish. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust you not in lying words, saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if ye thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if ye thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, and if you oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words, that cannot profit you. Cannot profit. Now watch this now. Watch. Watch. If this is not a picture of today's church, and I've been talking with pastors, Assembly of God pastors, they welcome me into their circle. 
But I talked to some of them. One of them is a very good friend. We just went to dinner at his house Friday night with other pastors. But I'm just as firm and steadfast with him. When I talked to him about the ways and the things of the condition of the church, I said, will you steal? Now remember, God's telling this to the church. Stand at the gate. Proclaim it at the gate so that everyone hears this. Will you steal? You say, but pastor, I don't steal. Do you lie on your taxes? Tax time. Do you lie? Do you cheat so you can get extra money? Do you steal cable from your neighbor? Hello? Murder? I don't murder. Do you hate someone? Jesus said if you have hatred in your heart, it's like you kill that person. Commit adultery? I don't commit adultery. You commit adultery with the Lord? Do you have something else in your life that you love more than you love God? That's adultery, spiritually. Do you swear falsely? Do you? Do you lie? If you get cornered into a situation, do you lie to get out of it? Do you burn incense to Baal? Do you walk after the gods whom you know not? Do you do all those things and you come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered to do all these abominations? Tell me that does not describe a church in the United States today. Oh, you're saved by grace. Grace covers it all. Don't worry about it. You can still sin and you're still saved. Doesn't affect your salvation. Once saved, always saved. You want to do all those things and come and stand in the house of the Lord? No. No. What I love about God is, like Jezebel, like the church of Thyatira, he gives you time and space to repent. But you've got to hear the voice. You've got to repent. See, because that spirit will ruin your life. It'll destroy marriages. It'll take away everything away from your life. And then what it will do is, when it's taken everything out and brought you down to the lowest part that you can be, that voice, that spirit of Jezebel comes and says, why don't you kill yourself? The final domination of your spirit, man, to hold you captivity in hell forever. That's what the ultimate goal of that spirit is. Men in this church, it's time for you to rise up and take the leadership positions of your homes and also in your church. That doesn't mean you treat your wife like a slave. I don't care what ethnic background you have. Wives are not property. They are daughters of God. How you treat them is how God looks at how you treat him. Say, well, I don't believe that, Pastor. Read your Bible. Jesus said, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it as unto me. Hello. So many women are bitter, angry at men because men abuse their authority. And if I could for a moment say to you, please forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgive them. Otherwise, you yourselves will be in bondage. Forgive them. Oh, pastor, you don't know what they have done to me. How they abused me. Mentally, physically, spiritually, sexually. 
as they were driving that nail into Jesus' hand, he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Forgive them. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. I had so much more I want to go into, but I don't have the time. There's one thing you must know before I, when I close. The one thing you need to do when you're attacked by the Spirit is you need to stand up and say this word. No. No. Say it with authority. No. Jezebel Spirit, you will not have my children. You will not rule havoc in my home. You will not cause division between me and my wife. Men, you need to stand up and stop being Ahabs. Because that spirit has whipped them into being your Ahabs. That dominating spirit whips them and keeps them silent. But I'm saying today, men, rise up. Take control of your house spiritually. Say, enough's enough. I've been docile, I've been quiet, I've been laid back. I have not taken my rightful place, but I'm taking it today. And woman, be careful how you manipulate. Pastor, we don't manipulate. I'll bet you some husband can tell you how, because you didn't get your way, there was no intimate relationship between you for a week. Because you held out on him. Hello? Oh yeah, it goes on. Be careful. That spirit will infiltrate you. And it's so subtle. That feministic spirit. There's nothing like a man of God loving a woman of God. There's nothing like that. If your parents are like that, you're blessed. But when your parents are not like that, you know what goes on in that home. The debate, the arguments, the fighting, the backbiting, the tearing apart, the cursing, the swearing. All jockeying for position. Let 2015 be the year we begin to pray for discernment. To say, Lord, we are not going to defile your house. We are not going to come into the house of, of Judah, the house of praise, on Sunday and go out and get drunk on Friday and Saturday. Hello? Amen. Live like the devil and come and stand before him and say, I'm delivered to do all those things. Not so, Lord. I want this to be a year of tremendous growth in your lives for you to grow as Christians, for you to take the mandate to share your faith, not just your party times, but share your faith. Care about someone. Reach out to someone. Let them know that you care. Reach out to your friends that are lost. They're here one day, gone the next. And they cry and they weep, saying, I was just with him yesterday, and now he's gone. And you had an opportunity to witness, and you didn't. What are you afraid of? The spirit of Jezebel is what you're afraid of. Take authority over that spirit. Amen? Let's stand this morning. Father, there was so much more I needed to say. Let this church be a place 
of passion and compassion. A place where the truth is spoken in love. A place, God, where lives will be transformed and renewed, oh God. Lord, I don't want a place. I don't want a place where people are just coming to church just to come to church. Lord, just playing the part. Lord, I want to come to a place where these people love you with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. God, that will take authority over these spirits in these last days and begin to warfare in prayer, God. Begin to fight the battle in prayer, oh God. In their workplace, in their home, wherever they go, whatever they do, Father. I pray, Lord God, that you would help them to live a life of godliness and holiness and righteousness, including myself. That Lord, we'll serve you, that you'll give us discernment to know what's of you and what's not of you. Because you said there would be many false prophets in the last days. They will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. They come looking like a sheep, smelling like a sheep, bah, like a sheep. But inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. They want to tear apart at your soul. By their fruit, you shall know them. Father, help us. I pray a blessing upon your people, God. I pray, Lord God, that you will be with them. Your Holy Spirit will bring back to remembrance these words. Father, I've done my best, and I pray, God, that you will do your part to take this word and bury it deep within their hearts and within their souls. Because, God, there's such lukewarmness in the world today, such lukewarmness in your church today at large. And let us not be like that, Father. Let us be a church on fire. 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 Let us be a church on fire for you, God. Let us be a church on fire. Bless them, Father, and they're going in, they're coming out. They're lying down, they're rising up. For you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the living God. You are almighty God. You are Yahshua HaMashiach. You are Jesus the Christ the son of the living God. I don't care what man says. I don't care what religion says. You're not the son of God. You are the son of God. I don't care if they say that you're not God in human flesh. You are God in human flesh. I don't care if they say you didn't really die. I know you really died because I'm living. My, my eternal salvation is, is alive and I'm alive to live because you rose from the dead on that third day. You ask me now how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Father, thank you for these people today. Thank you for their ears. Now, if they have ears, let them hear in the spirit what the spirit has to say today. Father, give them ears to hear what the spirit of God has to say for their life. And Father, let them know that they are loved in this place. That Father, your love and your mercy and your grace gives us the opportunity to make things right with you. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning.